I can also talk about fandom in that period. Fandom in that period, well, if we talk about television, what was available for fan in fandom for television, science fiction, fantasy, etc., there wasn't anything yet because regular TV broadcast had just started. In film, well, we had, uh, among others, Buck Rogers, the very first Buck Rogers serial starring uh, Buster Crabbe, the son of Frankenstein, the return of Dr. X, the Wizard of Oz, and the Phantom Creeps, which is, oddly enough, a serial starring uh, the late, great Bela Lugosi, and The Man They Could Not Kill. And those were some of the science fiction movies that came out. I do have, I think, all of them scheduled for reviews as the year goes on. Then there was radio. Radio had started to come in into its own at this time. It wasn't completely there yet in terms of what it would be by the early 1940s and then stay that way all the way until the 1950s and even into the 1960s, some of them. So Buck Rogers was really the only thing on radio that existed. Uh, I would note that the year before, uh, The Shadow had its last season on radio. If you don't know, The Shadow is that one that always starts with the voiceover. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow knows. <laughs> so that was that one. Um, Big Show w would have made my list here had it not stopped the year before. Then we get into literature. Hey, Captain Jesse, how are you doing tonight? Then we get into literature. This was the beginning of what is usually called the golden age of science fiction. It was where began the careers um, of people whose names we still know today as giants in their field. It's cold outside. I'm not even sure what it is around here. 41 degrees. It's not bad. It's kind of warm for January, but hey, I ain't looking no gift horse in the mouth. You know what I'm saying? So these giants, some of the names, not all of them, but some of the names that would start to come out of this period, Robert A. Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, A. E. Van Vocht, E. E. Doc Smith, we just call him Doc Smith, Frederick Pohl, and Ted Sturgeon, among many others. I have to talk specifically about Astounding Stories magazine. This was the most influential science fiction magazine of all time time. In fact, much of modern science fiction, t films, and TV owe everything to Astounding Stories. Now, many of the early issues of Astounding are now in the public domain, and I have a link below specifically to the first issue, January 1930. It's in my description box. Go there, read that magazine, because you're going to, under to figure out that, my God, they are examining some of the exact same themes that we do today. Exactly the same. It's couched in different science that was as good an estimate as they could make in 1930. And, and 1930, I think, is when that first came out. The best estimation of the future they could make then. It is completely wrong, of course. Tech always dates. But... It's interesting to read that issue because you go through and you go, my God, this theme is something that we use today. This theme is something we use today. It's why being a fan die master, there's so little that's new in the world. So John W. Campbell, who is something of a legend, became the editor of Astounding Stories in 1937, and he took Astounding toward a very hard science fiction. Uh, science fiction. Now, you, the difference between hard and soft science fiction. Hard science fiction, you spend a lot of time talking about the tech, how things work, so that the uh, reader can go, okay, yeah, good, makes logical sense all the way through. Soft science fiction is a little more concerned with story and character development, things like that. Not that you can't have that in hard science, but it is more of a focus with soft science. So Astounding became a hard science science fiction magazine. So that meant anything it published had to be in that general direction. So in July of 1939, which is cited generally as the start of the golden age of Astounding uh, Stories, and in turn of science fiction generally, the July 1939 issue, 
because in that issue, they contained A.E. Van Vogt's very first story and a very early story by Isaac Asimov. In the August 1939 issue of Astounding, they put the uh, printed Robert Heinlein's very first story, and he would go on to write a lot of stuff for them. In September of 1939, I mean, it's, it's, it's July, August, September, and in September of 1939, Theodore Sturgeon's first story appeared in Astounding Stories. So we are getting into the literary science fiction giants at this point. H.G. Wells wrote his last novel, The Holy Terror, this year. Uh, he obviously had written a lot of novels, probably most famous for The War of the Worlds, but he did others, and his last one was released this year. One of the funny ones that you're going to see go past on my slideshow is one called Capitan Nemo. Now, this was a Czechoslovakian science fiction novel written by J.M. Truska. It was a sequel to Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But it wasn't written by Verne, and I'm sure he wouldn't have been that thrilled with it. I'm sure he wasn't thrilled with it. But they did that sometimes. They did that sometimes where authors would make basically sort of an unauthorized sequel to something that somebody else had did. And if you really want to see this at work, there is a really horrible sequel to War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. It is called Edison's Conquest of Mars. It is about an Earth counterattack of Mars that is led by Thomas Edison. And there are other big names in that book as well. It is on Project Gutenberg. I don't have a link for it. Just search for it for yourself. Um, Edison's Conquest of Mars, and you will find it. It is terrible. Uh, all right. Other things that were going on in there, characters that were coming around. The Avenger, who was kind of a knockoff of The Shadow, but he was in his own magazine. Uh, Batman was first released this year, was first published in Detective Comics number 27 in May of 1939, slightly less than a year after Superman had first been printed in June of 1938. There was also in science fiction the Lensman series. Now, this was a series written by Doc Smith, and he had begun it in 1934 in Amazing Stories. However, one of them uh, was, that was going to become a novel, Gray Lensman, was published in Astounding from 1939 to January 1940. Um, it would not be actually, it, it was, it, this is an extremely influential series. The Lensman series is extremely influential. Once you know the Lensman series, you will never look at Green Lantern and the Green Lantern Corps the same ever. They practically stole the concept. Edgar Rice Burroughs was very, very uh, active at this time, very prolific author, um, wrote a lot of adventure stories with some science fiction threw in from time to time. Uh, so this year, he, he, they published uh, Synthetic Men of Mars, which was the ninth out of ten in Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom series. Now, he called it Barsoom because it took place on Mars, but the actual residents of Mars called it Barsoom. So that's his Barsoom series. He also wrote Land of Terror, which is the sixth and last novel in his P Pellucidar series. It was written this year, actually. It wasn't published until 1944. Pellucidar was a land that was under the earth, beneath the earth, and he actually did a crossover with Tarzan once. He was, of course, associated with Tarzan probably more than anything else, and he was writing his 20th, he published his 20th out of 26 Tarzan novels in 39, which was called Tarzan the Magnificent. Then there was Carson of Venus, the third of five of his Venus story, uh, series. Um, go read them. <laughs> Most of Edgar Rice, I think all of Edgar Rice Burroughs now, all of his books are now in the public domain. And I have a link in my description box so that you can go out and take a look at all the books that he wrote. I would suggest that if you have not read it, try reading A Princess of Mars, which is the first book in that Mars series. Uh, they're all very good. 
So we get off a little bit more in fandom with the fanzines. Hello, Larry. Larry, and yes, we always have my towel. You can't see it right now, I don't think, in my background, but uh, I guess a little bit at the top over that. Um, speaking of fanzines, okay. Uh, fans did exactly the same thing back then as they do now. The technology was very different. What they could do was limited, and subject matter, to some extent, was limited. However, they did write fan fiction. They did do their own artwork, is as evidenced by what we're seeing here. And in order to do anything with this, they got you know you couldn't just put it up on the internet for somebody to see. There was nowhere to put it. So what you would do was you, you would gather up various stories or artwork that you and other people had done. You would duplicate off, hopefully just as many copies as you would need. And then you would sell them generally to members of a local science fiction club. We have one here in Lincoln, Nebraska, the uh, Starbase Andromeda, which has uh, been running forever since the 1970s. It has been running since then and still meets. So we had, we had a fanzine called uh, the Kelvin Outpost. Uh, Starbase Andromeda, Kelvins, if you know the original series, you got that one. It was called the Kelvin Outpost. And we did exactly what you see here. We would gather the stories up. Uh, in this case, we had mimeograph machines by then, thank God. Um, but you would put them together, run off as many copies as you hoped you needed, sell them to people inside your own fan club, and then maybe contact other fan clubs around the country and see if they wanted some copies or if they could trade. You did that oftentimes. You would trade one for the other. Now... The problem with doing this is, of course, we did not have, I lived through the tail end of this, we did not have um, any big computers or printers or anything like that. No mimeograph machines that you could, you know, did a machine, you could stick it in there and it comes out. No, 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 nothing like that. We would use uh, mimeograph machines, spirit duplicators, uh, and that sort of thing. There were a number of different technologies. Now, in the past... I have kind of talked about um, how this works. Uh, Captain Jesse says, are we going to have to get back to a Phantom series? I'm not sure what you mean there, Phantom series. Uh, I've talked about this stuff before. I've just talked about it. But as I was looking on YouTube, I found a very, very nice video. <laughs> A very nice video that shows you what I mean. I've edited it down. It's a couple of three minutes long. And so I'm just going to show it to you so you can see exactly what sort of insanity we had to go through when we use these things. The liquid duplicator is usually used to produce 50 to 100 copies. One of the most commonly used machines is the stencil duplicator or mimeograph. This one is manually operated. This one is electrically operated. Generally speaking, stencil duplication should be used when 50 to several thousand black copies These are, are for average work. They usually come in letter and legal size. A wide variety of insets may be purchased which can be cemented into stencils to give professional results. Remove the protective sheet that comes with the stencil and insert the cushion sheet with the wax surface facing the stencil. For a professional job, type evenly. Use a slightly slower speed and heavier touch to produce the best copy. When an error is made, roll up a few spaces. Pull back the plastic covering and brush a light coating of correction fluid over the error. Turn on the light and raise the horizontal ruling edge to position for your work. Select a lettering guide and place it on the ruling edge in alignment with your typewritten copy. Use the correct stylus for each guide. Its number is often stamped into the lettering guide. Use a firm, even pressure, but be careful not to tear the stencil. When you want to mimeograph drawings or other artwork, tape your copy to the mimeoscope in the position you'll want it to appear on the paper. 
put the writing plate over the copy and under the stencil surface. Now you can easily trace the artwork. First, get out your paper and place it in the feed tray. Adjust the paper feed. Set the counter for the number of copies you want to make. Open the right hand locking mechanism and loosen the ink pad cover. Relock the mechanism and peel back the cover. Open the left hand locking mechanism, remove the cover, and throw it away. Insert the stencil face down. Lock the top end into place. Keeping a firm pressure on the stencil and backing sheet, rotate the drum so that the stencil goes on smoothly and evenly. Tear off the backing sheet and throw it away. Run one copy and examine it carefully. There are many adjustments that can be made so that your work will appear at its best. The paper may be adjusted laterally, diagonally, or raised or lowered on the page. Wow. <laughs> Aren't you glad that you live in the Internet age? That was how they made all um, uh, fanzines until the early 1980s. As I say, I lived through the tail end of this. Boy, am I glad. Uh, things they don't mention in there about that. A couple of things. Um, uh, Captain Jesse, fandom writing sci-fi TV. Let me get to that in a second. Let me get to that in a second. Uh, Larry, Larry says, 10,000 science fiction fan scenes to be digitized as a part of the University of Iowa initiative. Yeah, I ran across that. I'm glad to see that. Hopefully they'll be digitized and in public because I will spend a lot of time reading them. One of the things about those that d they don't mention here is the ink that was used for that. Uh, the stench was unbearable. Uh, in fact, I had to do things like running off tests and quizzes as a teacher's assistant for one semester in high school, and they kept theirs in the teacher's lounge, which meant the teacher's lounge smelled of this stench like bad. You really needed to just like open up windows and put big fans on it and pour it out, but they never did. And you could get the ink on your fingers. As you might imagine, she was going through a lot of care not to get her ink on her fingers, but it was very easy to do so. One of the things about that is they were using black ink in that industrial that I showed you. However, one other uh, color that they used was kind of a purple ink, right? So you'd make the co co copies and then come out kind of purplish. Did that all the time in high school. That led to some interesting things among fans. In the 1920s, um, the New York Futurians, who were the, uh, you know, the premier science fiction uh, fan club of all time, had to come up with a fictional god of science fiction. They called this fictional god Goo, G-H-U. Now, Goo's holy colors were purple. And so this led to some fanish oaths that I still sometimes use today when I don't want to use the word God because that will, um, you know, cause some people to become upset. Some people are offended when you use the word God as an oath. So sometimes I will use goo. And some of the oaths that came out of that period were by goo's holy purple fingers and by goo's holy purple robes. Um, sometimes you'll hear me say that maybe great goo as opposed to something else. Again, if I'm trying to do something where I'm not, I'm trying explicitly not to, uh, you know, uh, tick off anyone of faith. Uh, Larry, Larry says good ventilation was a must and you got blue fingers. Yes, yes. And that's what led to all of that stuff. Uh, Cam just says Starfleet Studios is totally separated themselves from Star Trek CBS name. Um, yeah, I don't think we're going to see much in the way of fan films anymore. I think the heyday of that ended in, in 2016 because of those rules. I mean, you may be separated from them, but you are still subject to their rules. 
Uh, I think if fan writers, really good ones, were picked up, the, some of their stories were picked up by other science fiction and adapted, you know, turned it into an episode of the Orville or something like that, the good ones could be very, very good indeed. And a lot of times the fanfic, even if it's not written well, delves into ideas and situations that we have not seen before and would be interesting to have on an actual science fiction television program. Uh, yeah, copying blueprints, Larry, Larry says, smelled awful too. Yeah, any use of that ink, the stench was unbearable. You really needed a fair amount of uh, ventilation. And I was always amazed. I'd go down to the teacher's lounge. I mean, this is where the teachers hang out when they don't have a class, right? And it smelled like hell, you know? <laughs> I'd also mention that the use of goo, when I talk about goo, uh, has led me early on in my life to use fictional curse words whenever possible. When I say frack, it's because for most of my life, that is how, since 1978, that is what I've substituted for fuck. I substitute frack for fuck. And I oftentimes will substitute goram for goddamn because it's something that will not offend anyone. And the fun part about it was in uh, grade school, high school, etc., when I was using frack. Well, if you said fuck, the teachers had something that they could do to you. They could send you to the principal's office because that was not anything like tolerable language at all in that time period. But when you said frack, there was nothing they could do. <laughs> it wasn't a curse word, not really. Everybody knew exactly what you meant, but you weren't going to go to the principal's office over a fictional word. This has also impacted me later in life. I think that anyone can say the seven deadly words, as Carlin said, that you can't say on television. Anyone can say shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Those are the deadly seven, according to Carlin, the ones that will warp your mind, corrupt your soul, and keep America from winning the war. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Anyone can say those words. Anyone whatsoever. It takes creativity and intelligence to curse the way that I try to curse. It's something where maybe people won't always know what the hell you're saying, but they can't be really offended by it. And in any case, it's far more creative. It shows, if you're a science fiction fan, please, please, curse with fictional curse words. Make up oaths like, by goose holy purple fingers or some variation, because it sets you apart as being a hell of a lot smarter than most other fandoms for anything. Larry Larry says teachers would drink to avoid the stench. I never saw that, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs>